Welcome to season two of Barry Interesting from Acorp Media. I'm Barry Acock, your host, and I want to share with you some of the changes we have made for our second season. Exciting times here. We have a new look to our set that you will notice in most of our new episodes. We just finished this set design on August 31st, thanks to our friend and favorite contractor, Scott Stevens. Scott and his whole crew, they're the best in the world. He's a real artist and did a great job designing this set. Thanks, thanks a bunch, Scott, and to your whole crew. We did record a couple of our interviews before we got the new set completed, but you will see the difference throughout the season. Another thing you will notice right away is a change in format. Our first season was all interviews, with each episode consisting of a single lengthy interview with a person of interest. We're not getting away from those important interviews, but we are going to present shorter interviews with the new segments each episode. There will be a short news update, as well as a human interest segment. We will also be introducing you to some recurring characters who you will grow to love. We'll also be previewing our two new shows for the season. Our lineup of guests who will appear over the next two and a half months is certainly exciting. Some episodes will feature people from our region with a unique and inspiring story to tell while other episodes will feature newsmakers from around the state of Missouri. Additionally, we're releasing two feature-length documentaries this season that will be previewed on Very Interesting. One is about the life and times of Norm and Debbie Swafford from right over here in Bernie, Missouri. The other will focus on the history of Los Brisas restaurants, which started 17 years ago right here in Malden, Missouri. We really have some exciting things to offer to you between now and November 19th. So look for Barry Interesting every Thursday night on Facebook and YouTube, Acorp Media. You don't want to miss it. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in the most significant disruption in sports across the globe since World War I. The reduction of such a familiar and consistent part of our daily lives is one of the many adjustments we've had no other choice but to adapt to. The first case of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, arrived in the United States on January 21st of this year. Most of us really didn't have an understanding of what that meant for the remainder of the year or how it would directly impact so many areas of our ordinary routines. From the H1N1 outbreak in 2009 to the Ebola crisis in 2014, many Americans suspected we'd be in for a similar situation. And while both were alarming, in comparison to COVID-19, neither had such an impact on the lives of the majority of Americans. On Wednesday, March 11, 2020, Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive for COVID-19. Hours later, the National Basketball Association announced the suspension of the 2019-20 NBA season. Following the NBA's decision, a domino effect took place. College basketball's most electrifying event, March Madness, was canceled on March 12th. This was the first outright cancellation of the NCAA basketball tournament in the entirety of its 81-year history. The NHL, MLB, and other professional sporting leagues followed near immediate suit. By March 20th, Americans were living in a country without sports. Running parallel to the cancellation of sporting events, countless changes continued taking place for Americans everywhere. In less than one month's time, the lives of many Americans were unrecognizable. I say this to draw more perspective to a segment covering the loss of sports. By no means does the loss of March Madness or opening day at Bush Stadium outweigh the devastating consequences of this pandemic that many have faced. The loss of employment, access to basic services that millions depend on, closing the doors on a business that took decades to build, 
and of course, the human toll of this tragic event. As of this week, 188,000 Americans have lost their lives to COVID-19. Hundreds of thousands of families in this country alone have dealt with a loss that won't come back in a bubble, a season that will never resume. We've all endured a dark six months together, and while there have been many points that lead us to wonder whether we'll ever see the light again, there have been inspiring stories of triumph over hope in this time. From our heroes in the healthcare field, first responders, and now our educators, those people have dropped everything and put their own selves in situations of, risks, of risk for others. The leaders in these moments draw us all a bit closer together, and in many ways, they've revealed what community truly means to us all. In that sense, I'm pleased to see the return of sports. ESPN, contri ESPN contributor Wright Thompson made the statement that COVID-19's halt of the sports world gave us time to consider life without the games we love, a time to reflect. According to Wright, the only thing he truly missed about them was the sense of community they provided for us. In his video for the 2020 ESPY Awards, which happened to be dedicated to and filmed at the iconic Butchers Pool Hall in Columbia, Missouri, Thompson dives deeper into what sports truly means to all of us. Is it about screaming at strangers on the internet or hugging some stranger at the pinnacle of a big game? Sports look different this year. Since their return late in the summer, we've all had a different experience in how we watch them, how the games look, and how to remain connected as we travel through a new world that, re that requires a little distance. Let's all consider that regardless of which side we have found ourselves on in the past. From the National League to the American League, Cardinals or Cubs, whatever tribe we find ourselves in, it's sports that brought us together. We're a bigger community living in a smaller world than we might have previously realized. And I'm personally looking forward to a safe, structured return to the center point of this country. Michelle and I would actually like to tell you a personal story about what happened to us when the world changed in March. We are part owners of the Texas Legends, which is a NBA G League team. That's the Dallas Mavericks G League team. The team invites us to games every year. So we showed up at the arena in March on spring break with our boys. Donnie Nelson, the GM of the Mavericks, took us all over the stadium that night, the night that COVID hit, the night that Rudy Gobert was uh, diagnosed with COVID. And it was a surreal night for Michelle and I because looking back, it's part of history. It was the last NBA game that was played before the world shut out. Players went through starting lineups, went through warm-ups, were prepared to take the court, but... But you could see the anxiety build that night, even on Donnie's face. The crowd was, you could feel the anxiety with the crowd, and it was just a surreal night for us. And I'll, I'll let Michelle give you her, her I agree. take on it. While it was a great game going on, we were watching a great game, hour by hour, you could sense a heightening anxiety with the leaders of uh, the Dallas Mavericks. And, uh, and you could, by the end, because by the end of the game, we knew kind of that things had changed and, and things may not be the same for a while. So experiencing that with total strangers and seeing things change as the night went on was really surreal. And, uh, and we just knew that it wouldn't be the same. We knew that it had something had changed and uh, I personally wanted to get out of Dallas as soon as possible, <laughs> but, uh, but it was- Yes, but we didn't yeah. panic. We stayed around right. for another day. The, the iconic part of the night, I think, when history shows, when the NBA shut down, Mark Cuban was standing about 30 feet from us whenever um, he delivered his famous interview about the status of the NBA. I mean, you, it was iconic on ESPN when he started getting the text messages that, about Rudy Gobert, about the NBA shutting down. I mean, it was uncertainty for him, it was uncertainty for the Mavericks, it was uncertainty for the fans. Like I said, the anxiety kept growing. The next day, although Michelle wanted to get out of Dallas, we actually went ahead and went to Frisco where the Texas Legends headquarters is. And it was another surreal moment. We walked in to all the employees being gone, all the locker rooms were cleaned out, 
And, you know, that affects the lives of many. You definitely knew that something had changed and it was not going to be the same, but uh, none of us could have probably predicted what was down the road. But looking back, we had a front row seat to history. That was the last game that the NBA had before it shut down. And I, I hate to keep using this word, but it was a surreal moment in history looking back. I think that that night for the NBA, for NBA fans, NBA historians, will be a night that we won't forget and the world of basketball will never forget. Tonight's guest is considered a legend by many here in the state of Missouri and all over the boot hill. He played under coach Gary Pinkle from 2004 to 2007 for what is arguably one of the greatest Missouri Tiger football squads of all time. A team that saw Mizzou ranked number one in the nation for the first time since 1960. In his senior season, he started all 12 contests, pulling in 84 receptions, a school record for 834 yards. His 203 receptions set a school record and were the most ever by a Big 12 Conference tight end. And his 2,175 career yards ranked second in school history and made him the third tagger to reach 2,000 career receiving yards. Selected by the Cleveland Browns in the 2008 NFL Draft, he played for a number of storied franchises before finishing his career right here for the Kansas City Chiefs in 2012. He's the son of a former state representative. He's followed in his father's footsteps politically since returning from St. Joseph. A great Missourian and an even better human being, please welcome my friend and his wife, Martin and Gianni Rucker. Welcome. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate you having us. Pleasure to have you here today. Gianni, welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you us. for coming. What in the world are y'all doing in Malden, Missouri? Did y'all get lost? <laughs> we did get lost. We were looking for some uh, inferior barbecue to Kansas City on our way to Memphis. And uh, I got a text message from this guy I know named Barry Acock. He asked me to come down and hang out on his farm and meet a couple people around here. And so uh, we got in late last night. And we've been having a blast ever since. Well, that's not true, but thank you. <laughs> We're going to get some barbecue later. There we go. So, Gianni, tell me a little bit about your family, how you met, how you met Martin, your children. I met Martin when I was a senior at Mizzou, and he was back in town for a softball home run derby. Um, Jeremy Macklin was putting it on in Columbia, and we ran into each other um, at a bar downtown in Columbia. So, was it love at first sight? Absolutely. Um, he told his friend, a mutual friend of ours, Tommy Saunders, he played football with him. He said, I think I just found my wife. And when I saw him, I was telling my friends, oh my goodness, I need to marry this guy. So it was, it was instant. I think we mentioned marriage for the first time about a month after meeting. <laughs> so Martin, this is a trick question, but you might not necessarily be the best athlete to come out of Mizzou in your family. Your wife played volleyball for Mizzou, correct? Very true. <laughs> so tell us about your volleyball career. I did. I started at Long Island University Post Campus in New York. And then after two years, I ended up transferring to Mizzou. I walked on. I played there my junior spring season. And then I went back to New York for my super senior season for my last year of eligibility. But uh, tell us a little bit about your dad. I, I've never met your dad. Everybody tells me he's a great guy. Yeah. You know, I've been involved in democratic politics. Your dad was a state rep from the St. Joseph area. Yeah. So tell us about your mom, your dad, and your, your brother, and your sister. Yep, awesome. Um, my dad was a union sheet metal worker for 33 years. You know, um, He played college basketball, uh, played at JUCO in Wyoming, and he never got his degree, but uh, he, uh, he worked really hard. You know, He worked 12-hour shifts, and we were a family that we didn't have everything that we wanted, but we had everything that we needed. You know, and uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom at the time. And so, uh, you know, he worked 12-hour shifts on end, but I always tell people that my mom's job was harder than his because she was raising myself and my three other siblings at home. Um, but they always taught us to give back to our community. You know, uh, they raised us in the church, and while we had everything that we needed, they taught us that kids in our school and families in our community didn't always have everything that they needed. And so we were taught to give back when we could. And um, that was something that was rooted deeply within myself and my siblings as well. And, you know, you touched on the politics. Well, my dad was, uh, and, and my mom as well, they both served on various boards in the community, and they were really involved. And so one day, 
my dad came home and he was like, oh, I think I'm gonna run for state representative. <laughs> and we're sitting around the dinner table and we go, uh, well, what's a state representative? <laughs> you know, we didn't even know what it was. Um, and so he ran and he won. And that was kind of where I got bit by the bug because I was able to see the good that you can do when you're there for the right reasons. You know, when you're there to try to help people and not just to play politics, politics or further advance yourself or your career, you can really do some good things for the people in your community and the people in your state. So your brother played for Nebraska yeah, and he played yeah. for the Carolina Panthers, correct? Mm -hmm. So being from Missouri and a, probably a big Mizzou fan growing up, how did that go over in your household? <laughs> so he was a big Mizzou fan actually, and he wanted to go to Mizzou, but they didn't recruit him. Um, they didn't recruit him very hard early on. And then once Nebraska came in the door, then um, Coach Smith started calling. And by then Mike had pretty much already made up his mind. And um, fortunately and unfortunately, it worked out really well for him. You know, he won three national championships while he was at Nebraska. We got to travel all over the country watching him play and going to bowl games. And so that was really cool. And for a young kid from a small town like St. Joe, we didn't have a lot of those athletes. I actually, I couldn't, at that age, couldn't tell you any. And so to be exposed to that and to see what I could become if I stayed on this track, if I stayed on this path, if I got good grades, if I worked really hard to see that that could be a reality, it was so huge for me. And so I just tried to pattern everything that I did after his career and after the work ethic that my father taught me and that my mother instilled in us growing up. So your mom and dad were kind of a team on everything, but your brother probably inspired you just as much as your mom yeah. and dad because he, he was waving that carrot. Absolutely. I've made it, you haven't yet. Yep, and your parents, you know, my parents were telling me, you can do it, you know, and then Mike was the example of, yes, you can. It wasn't just words that they were feeding me at the dinner table or something that I was reading in a book. It was something that I was able to see uh, every day for four years, five years while he was at Nebraska and then for another nine while he was in the NFL. So Mike was drafted when? Second round in 98, 98 was his draft class. So what's it like to be sitting there with your brother about to go to the NFL? I mean, not many families get to feel that emotion. <laughs> yeah. Was it nerve wracking? Did you think he wasn't gonna get drafted? He finally got drafted in the what, second round. Second round. Mm -hmm. It was so cool and you watch the first round go by and I'm, I think 12 years old at this time. And so I know my brother is a good football player, right? Like he's the best thing I've ever seen, of course. But you don't understand the full gravity of what's about to happen and what he's going through. And our house is packed with people, his high school coaches, a bunch of friends from the community, people from church, family members and things like that. And so we're just watching it go by, you know, watching all the names be picked. And then uh, the, the cordless phone rings. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, he picks up the phone and uh, his agent had called a couple times. And then this one was a little bit different, you know, it's yes, sir, yes, sir, uh, I'd love to, sir. And uh, everybody's just staring and you can kind of sense that this is a different phone call. And then um, you see the name come across the screen, Carolina Panthers select Mike Rucker in the second round. And I mean, everybody just exploded. I bet you that was a great oh, feeling. It was so cool. It was something that I'll never forget. And, you know, just remembering that feeling. And then you fast forward to 2008 and hearing my name called and getting that phone call it was like i felt how he felt and i remembered all the emotions from back then too and it was just just so cool it's something that a lot of families don't get to experience let alone twice and uh, to be able to see my brother go through it and then to feel like because we're 10 years apart so we never got to play against each other but to feel like we're a part of the same thing the same brotherhood was really really cool i bet your mom and dad were so proud <laughs> they are they are they were um and they're so supportive they, uh, you know, we were very fortunate to grow up with the parents that we have. And it was so, so cool uh, for them, for me to be able to make it as well, because I know how happy they were and how much fun they had following my brother around. So to be able to help them relive that and continue that tradition on was really, really special to me. What, what are some of your hobbies? Well, let's get into that. Yeah, I love to hunt, love to fish. Um, obviously I love sports. Don't really play them too much anymore because I don't want to get hurt and getting hurt's not the problem. It's rehabbing the hurt. <laughs> so I don't feel like going through that again. Um, but uh, I, I love to hunt and love to fish. Those are probably my main things. And I love just hanging out with my family, um, parents and everything included, but hanging out with my immediate family now that we're building and um, just enjoying friends around the area. So Martin, after football, we're gonna get into that later. Sure. We're teasing the audience right now with the football <laughs> stuff. So 
What's your real job during the day? So right now I own my own trucking company. Um, whenever I retired from playing football, I had a buddy who got me involved in real estate development. And so through that, I got interested in construction. And I had a couple of mentors that were helping me transition from the NFL to the real world. And um, I told one of them that I was interested in owning my own business and so and in construction. And he said, well, uh, I've got a guy you should probably talk to. And so he introduced me to Jim Kissick. And Jim Kissick owned Kissick Construction there in Kansas City. It's one of the largest uh, full service construction firms there. And so I met with Jim and told him that I wanted to own my own construction company one day. And he said, uh, you know, that's a great idea. He said, if you can own your own minority construction company that can show up, can do the work, doesn't need their handheld, he said, you'll never run out of work in this town. I said, have wow. you ever done construction before? He said, well, you know, I built a clubhouse or two when I was a kid. How hard could it be, right? And he says, well, I suggest you come work for me for a little while and lose a little bit of my money before you go out on your own and lose all yours. He told me that on a Friday. I started on the next Monday. And I actually started out in the ditch putting water line pipe together when Kansas City was building the streetcar. And I did that for about three months from October to January. So it was cold, had my car hearts on and everything. Going from the football field and suits to car hearts and wrenches. I did that for about three months and then I started riding around with our supervisor and foreman. And then I moved into the office to the project engineer role and moved into project management. And I did that for the last six years. And then last year, I bought three dump trucks and I was working my full-time job and I uh, was running these three dump trucks. And then just this April, I bought nine more. So now I have 12 dump trucks. And on June 1st of this year, I left my full-time job and now I work for myself full-time. Gianni, are you co-signing for all these dump trucks? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So Gianni, that's interesting. I, I see how come he doesn't come home for supper at night. So <laughs> he's busy. So what do you- So much work. What's your career? So I do marketing automation for mortgage companies. And then I also run a ministry. So Value Unconditional, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. And we help people heal from trauma. There is absolutely nothing better than doing that. Because everything that we do, we walk people through God's word. And it's at the pace that they're ready for. We don't pressure anybody to share anything that they're not ready for. But having the opportunity to just take them through the Bible and unpack it in ways that maybe they hadn't considered before or ways that they hadn't applied to some of those wounded areas of their pasts. Mm -hmm. The breakthroughs, I mean, it's life-changing. Not only for them, but even to just be a part of that and to witness it, it's, it's amazing. And I found out last night you've written a book. <laughs> I did. I wrote a book in 2018 called Trauma Sensitive Purity. And that is a Bible-based guide for parents to talk to their kids about bodies and boundaries and birds of the bees, all the tough conversations, just to give them a little bit of a guide from God's perspective. We should you, be able to talk to our kids about tough stuff. You had my wife at hello when you started talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'll have to send you guys a copy. <laughs> We're looking forward to it. So that's great. Great work you're doing there. Thank you. And y'all go to Hillsong Church in Kansas City, correct? That's a very large church. It is. It's, very, it's a global church. And, um, you know, they're very good at engaging the youth, um, but also teaching the Word of God. You know, there's so much in religion now that is agenda-driven. And it was very refreshing to go to a church that preaches the Word of God and it preaches acceptance. And it's all about bringing people to God, not telling people why they don't fit in um, to God's mold, because there isn't a mold, you know. Um, Jesus Christ himself walked with everyone, and it was his mission to bring those who didn't believe in him to him, not push them further away. And so we really feel like this church does a great job at that. And Johnny serves on the coffee team, and uh, I was on the welcome team and have recently transitioned into uh, the young adults um, teaching role there at the church. And so it's been a really good opportunity for growth for myself, um, for her as well, and just another way that we're able to give back to our community. And y'all do a lot of uh, volunteer work in your community. Can you give me an example of some of that? Yeah, sure. You want to start? Um, if it relates to any and everything around sexual violence, I have probably contributed in some <laughs> way. I've been a hospital advocate, um, legal advocate, obviously with our ministry. It, it's so important to me to serve people who don't necessarily feel like in their everyday life they have safe people that they can talk to about some of the things that they've experienced. So many of these men and women, um, obviously a majority are women, but so many of these people will try to share and then they're met with 
questions that make them feel like it was their fault. So it's so important to me to just be able to come alongside them and let them know that I believe them and I'm there for them and I want to support them however I can and however they want me to. It's not about me telling them how they need to move forward with their healing journey. It's supporting them where they are. Well, Martin, you can't answer that question any better, so I'm not <laughs> going to ask you. So I do have a question for both of y'all. Sure. How has your faith, you seem to be a couple of faith. I think that's the reason your marriage has been so successful. So how has your faith guided you in your career and in your uh, football career and your work career with the new, new business you have? Well, it's the root of everything I do, right? And so everything that I do, I always bring it to God first. And then um, I heard a saying a long time ago that if God brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. And so you're gonna go through trials, you're gonna go through tribulations, but as long as you keep on pressing and you always keep him at the front, even if it doesn't work out, whatever you fall into is gonna be where he had you and it's gonna be better than what you thought you actually wanted. And so I always just keep that in my mind. Um, the other thing is, is we're nothing without God and it does, it's not gonna work without him. So sometimes you may get upset and it's okay uh, to talk to him about that and tell him about that. But if you turn from him, whatever you think you're going through and how bad you think it is now, it can get a whole lot worse. And so I think part of that is my upbringing as well. You know, my parents, uh, rooted us deeply in the church and I've just seen him show up in my life so many times and um, he's kept me uh, from different things that could have gone wrong um, and he's also kept me from things that could have gone right and everything has led me to this chair right here and I wouldn't change a thing about it and so I'm so very fortunate and very thankful for the role that God's played in my life and all the blessings that he's given me um, and the tools that he's given me uh, to walk through life and also to help guide other people because sometimes you go through struggles and it's not for you It's for the next person you meet and you're going to be able to help steer them from something that could really alter their life or a decision That they would make that is not a very good decision. And so as long as you keep your eyes open uh, and your heart open uh, God will put you in the right place. Well, you two are living proof that dreams come true <laughs> But bad things happen, but they never last right? Absolutely so tough with, times don't last. That's right. Tough with your faith, do. it gets you through the hard times. Mm -hmm. So in 2016, probably 2015, the genetic defect that Martin had with his dad, <laughs> he decided to get into politics, right? Yep, he did. <laughs> he did. And I'm clearly not as pumped about the whole political side, but I supported him through it. He did. And he really wanted to uh -uh. just make a difference. So in 2016, Martin ran for state rep in District yeah. 14. 14 against Kevin Corlew. Mm -hmm. And it was a very contested race. You yeah. narrowly lost by like 900 votes, right? Yeah, something right, yeah. Like 52 to 47 mm percent -hmm. on both of your races. It was easy for me to remember. Yep. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your state rep race. You got your feet wet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your dad was a big campaign manager for you. You need to go see him. You need to go see him. <laughs> yep, he was an air traffic controller there. Um, but it was fun. You know, I really enjoyed uh, the opportunity to be able to help people in that manner. And, you know, we're from St. Joe. But St. Joe was about 47 miles north of where we live. So we weren't necessarily from the area that I was running in. And we'd only lived in that area for, oh, probably three months, four months before I decided to run. And um, so it wasn't like we just walked in here and we knew a bunch of people and we were shaking hands with our, our longtime neighbors and things like that. It was really a grind. And that was what I enjoyed about it. You know, playing sports, that was what I knew was grinding. And so we knocked doors, you know, and, and a rep, in, a, in a race like a state rep race, uh, especially in that district, it's all about knocking doors and getting your name out there. And so we knocked thousands and thousands of doors and that was my favorite part. A lot of candidates dread that part, but it was my favorite part because you got to get out and connect with people. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the media and the way the world is today, you would think that a six foot five, 250 pound black guy knocking on the door in the suburbs at 8.30 at night wouldn't go over too well. We never ran into any problems. And even people who disagreed with my views, we always had such a pleasant conversation. And some of them we won over, some of them we didn't, but everybody thanked me for running. They thanked me for being young and getting involved, and they thanked me for caring. And it was just so cool to see what people were really like and not what the TV is telling you or how things are being portrayed 
uh, regardless of, even on Facebook and, and Twitter. It's a lot easier to thunder thumbs a rude message than it is when the person shows up at your door. It really humanizes the process. Um, and I think it makes some people take a step back and say, oh, you know what? Maybe this whole thing isn't about the D or the R, but it's about the issues or it's actually about the person being a good person and not just uh, a Republican or a Democrat. And we need more civility in politics. And I think you've done a good job of promoting that in your races, both of them. Thanks. So did you not get enough in 2016? So you said, <laughs> by golly, I'm running again in 2018 for a bigger territory. Absolutely. Senate District 34? 34, yep. You run against Tony Luchtemeyer? Mm -hmm, I did. So tell us a little bit about that race. You, I mean, you got involved in some negative advertising. I know they got you confused for your dad, confused. for the school board. <laughs> so there was a lot of lies and negative advertising in there that was. race. So tell us a little bit about the flavor of that race. Sure. Um, you know, it, there, was a, there was a lot of dark money in that race. And so it was, a, it was a really big deal. It was the number one targeted Senate race in the state. And so you've got a lot of outside players, but you've also got a lot of the same old people that don't want to see the guard change. And so there were some very misleading ads. And at, actually, at one parade we went to, they had a tracker there. And so, you know, a guy with a little camera walks up to you and tries to ask you a bunch of agitating questions. And so literally for this entire probably three and a half mile parade route, this guy was following us and filming us, trying to get us to say something silly um, or agitate us into doing something to him or something like that. And so that was very interesting. And for me, that stuff doesn't really make me mad. It's kind of like, oh, I've seen this before. It's like, oh, they're trying to do that to us. Like, we must be doing really well. Gotcha. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so um, it was, uh, I say it was really cool, but that was just, you know, some of the dirty tricks and things that they tried to pull. And then a week before um, the election, they ran a mailer that uh, the St. Joseph School District had gone through some problems with a, a scandal with some money. And the people were, the proper people were punished. My father was on the school board at the time. And he was actually, uh, he was a member of the school board, but when all this went down, they actually elected him board president to see them through all of the regulatory things that they, and the compliance issues that they were dealing with to get everything resolved. So really, my dad was a bright spot in this whole investigation, but they, since my father and I have the same name, they tried to make it look like I was a part of this scandal and tried to tie my dad, me to my dad as part of the scandal when really, he was helping see it out of the darkness. And so that was one thing. And then about a week before, there was a law firm there in Kansas City that dumped $100,000 into uh, a pack that ran a bunch of negative TV ads literally a one week before the election. So there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting things that went into that race. And, you know, we still only lost by three points, three and a half points or so. And so uh, it, while we didn't win, it makes you feel good about what you were able to do, the conversations you were able to have, um, and some of the minds you were able to change and even open up because uh, we had a lot of support. We had a lot of support in areas that Democrats hadn't had support in in Platte and Buchanan County in a long, long time. Well, I think you'll be back one of these days, right? In politics, <laughs> we need you back. <laughs> so let's get into some issues like uh, African-American -Amer ownership of small businesses. Yeah. What can you tell a young African-American that's wanting to start their own business. Go do it, you know, and, and seek counsel of others. People are willing to help and people want to help. You just sometimes have to seek them out. And here in America, we have this, uh, this mantra, right, of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And it's just not a real thing. I mean, you have to do the work and you have to go through the struggles to make it go. But at the same time, no one gets anywhere without help from someone else. Along Everybody. The way. Every single person. Everybody can't be born to the right family, right? Exactly. And so don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to look stupid because whoever you're talking to, if they know that answer, they had to ask it themselves at one point. They're just a little further in their journey. And so being fearless, uh, not being afraid to be vulnerable, put yourself out there because at the end of the day, we're all real people. And when you're talking to another person and you're being open and you're being genuine, they can sense that. And oftentimes, especially if you're talking to a good person, they'll sense that and they'll want to help you because they'll see a little bit of themselves in you and they think, let me help this person get to where I am. And again, you're going to have to put in the work and there's going to be some nights where, you know, you're sleeping for two hours and you're getting up and doing the whole thing all over again, but it'll be worth it. You just got to keep going. You got to want, want it bad enough, right? Absolutely. And that's anything. 
So this is not a trick question, but it's a question that Democrats often get asked. Mm -hmm. And Republicans only like to frame the abortion issue as the unborn child. Sure. So how can you be a Democrat and be a Christian and be so strong in your faith? Because you don't control other people's decisions, right? Abortion's not a choice that I would make, but it's not up to me to decide what the other person should do. And that's the way Jesus was when he was here on earth. He never made anyone follow him. What he did was showed them an example of what they should aspire to be. And he lived it so well that there were so many people that wanted to follow him. So he never made anyone follow him. He just lived an exemplary life that made people want to do that. And I believe that that's what we're supposed to do here. It's our mission to live the way he lived, make people want to have a piece of what we have, which is him, and then, and we don't judge. Because we all know that whatever we've done wrong, or whatever somebody else has done wrong, we've done something just as equally bad, and there's no sin uh, that is greater than another. So just because you don't sin in the same way that someone else does, makes you no know better. Whatever it is that's your vice, whatever it is that is your untruth, um, it's no better than that person's. And so that's the lens that we need to look at, and that is what has always guided me. Gianni, you weren't a Democrat when you first <laughs> met your like, husband. Well, I didn't think I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I learned pretty quickly thereafter that um, perhaps I had more democratic views than I realized, but I, I was raised believing wholeheartedly up until 2016 that I was a Republican. <laughs> and I told him I was Republican, and he only called me out on it once very gently and said, honey, what, what Republican views do you have? And I started naming things off, and everything that I named was not a Republican view. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm apparently a Democrat. <laughs> I apparently have been for, for quite some time now and just hadn't realized it. So what's your answer to evangelicals that say you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat? I could sit here and talk about Jesus for hours, so I will try to condense this. <laughs> I think where people get really caught up is when they have been raised seeing so much of the legalistic side of religion. They learn about this book and they get the rules. Yeah. And they're not seeing their relationship. There's a scripture that so often gets used out of context, and it's, if you love me, you will obey my word. If you love me, you will follow these guidelines, but the love comes first. Amen. The love has to come first. It's, of course I love you, I'll do, I'll do whatever you want me to do, I, I love you, God. But we try to get people to follow all these rules in order to get the love, and they're doing it backwards. Amen. I want to love people so hard that they want to know where that love is coming from. Because my cup can only get filled up by God. If Jesus is flowing through me and I'm able to love on these people exactly where they are, no matter what they're going through, and they don't feel judged, and they can say, oh my goodness, I've never had somebody use this book to treat me this way. It does something different for them. Cool. You know, abortion ends up being such a big deal that people talk about, obviously, don't kill the babies, don't kill the babies. That's so much of the focus. That's what abortion is. But where I think people lose focus is if this person who is in this tough position where they feel like they have to make a decision, how would they respond to the situation that they're in if they felt like their community loved them wholeheartedly, supported them completely, mm -hmm. like they were going to have their back? Like when that person needs to go to work, hey, I will help you. I know you're in a tough situation right now. I'll, I'll watch your kids on the weekends so that you can go pick up that second job to provide for your family. <laughs> How different would people's lives be if they felt like they were really being loved on by the church the way that Jesus loved on people? Mm -hmm. So it really, really humbles me for y'all to be here today. It's an honor to have y'all on the set and come back sometime. Absolutely. Always welcome. You Thank say you. the word. Thanks, Barry. Great having you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. The audience has been waiting to get into Martin's football career after this very long interview that went really, really well. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So now we're going to transition Martin into his football career and we're going to test his football knowledge, all things Mizzou football. 
We're here in the studio today with Martin Rucker, famous Mizzou Tiger, and we're getting ready to play Name That Tiger. Are you ready for this, Martin? Absolutely. You sure? Yeah, let's get it on. Do you know your history? Uh, enough. <laughs> Don't disappoint the fans down here. I'll do my best. Who was the all-time career rushing leader for the University of Missouri football team? Brad Smith. Correct. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Who ranked number one and number two in all-time career, career receptions at the University of Missouri? Number one and number two. Number one and number two. Chase Kaufman, number one. Myself, number two. That is correct. Chase Kaufman had 247 receptions. Martin Rucker had 203 receptions. Chase Kaufman, that's pretty good. Sounds like you should have played a little bit more of that sophomore <laughs> year, shouldn't you? Yeah. Who has the all-time rushing record in a University of Missouri bowl game? Who has that record? That's easy one. Tony Tuff. Cotton. 08. 276 yards. Well, you're half right. It's 2007. My dad says. Yeah. <laughs> the last head coach to lead the Tigers to a conference championship. Come on, Mark, don't let the fans go. <laughs> it's been so long since the Blues won a college championship. No pressure. Uh, I'll we'll give you one hint. Yeah. It was the year I was born. Do the math backwards. <laughs> what are you, 25? So. 26. <laughs> I don't know, though. Dan Devine, 1969. Uh, sure. What player was drafted 13th in the 1979 draft by the San Diego Chargers? Oh, no, I'm have you ever met Kellen Winslow? No, but uh, fun fact, his son was the tight end in Cleveland when I got drafted. A soldier. I remember. <laughs> in what year were the NCAA rules changed to allow five attempts to get a first down? Uh, never, but uh, I think it was <laughs> 91 Colorado game against Mizzou. I thought this was a real, real question, <laughs> but I remember the famous fifth down play yeah. against the Colorado, right? Yep, Colorado. So the answer is 1990. 90, dang, I was close. I used to have a t-shirt that said, fifth down. <laughs> what was the only undefeated, untied season in Missouri football history? 1960 Orange Bowl team? Well, you're kind of right, but it's disputed. 1960 season, only lost to Kansas, beat Navy in the Orange Bowl. Kansas was found to have an ineligible player making the zoo a win by forfeit. Yeah, so make them 11 and 0. Player forfeited, scored two touchdowns in the game. You want to know where they could win the <laughs> I've got a feeling you didn't like Kansas. <laughs> when did the Mizzou chant start? Oh, man. 1971. <laughs> <laughs> 1976 against the Ohio State Buckeyes, when a clarinet player in the Marching Mizzou offered up the idea to compete with Ohio State's OHIO chant. Fun fact, I played for the Browns. I had no idea there was an OHIO chant until I got there. Makes sense now. Another fun fact, until my brother moved there three or four years ago, I've never heard of it either. <laughs> so this is, this is the question for all the marbles. Which is a too easy a question for you to win the championship. All right. The Missouri Tiger is known for his tail twirling antics and shooting water out of a fire truck after a Mizzou victory. His unmistakable striped fur makes him a staple at all Mizzou games. What is his name? True. True and the Tiger. Yeah. That's a winner, guys. <laughs> so, Martin, thank you for playing. Absolutely. Yeah. Mizzou trivia. I'm surprised I did so much. You know your Feel trivia. You know your trivia for sure. <laughs> so Martin, are you ready to talk about your life in football? Yeah. This is only athletics. Okay. Although I did find out that you ran track in high school, right? I sure did. So tell us a little bit about your high school career. When did you really know that I'm going to be an NFL football player? I'm that good. Sixth grade. Wow. <laughs> it's funny, I promise you sixth grade was a year I made up in my mind I was going to be a professional football player. Um, I actually was the only sixth grader who started signing his papers, signed my autograph on my papers instead of printing my name. 
because that's what professional football players and college players did. And, um, you know, I was a, one of those kids that was naive enough to think that when people told me all I had to do was work really hard, I could be whatever I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So I thought as long as I worked really hard, I could be a professional football player. My son thinks the same thing. He's practicing his autograph right now, and he's going into the sixth grade. So. Sounds like a smart kid. <laughs> Mark, you were a three-star tight end coming out of high school with multiple offers from Power Five schools, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado State, and Mizzou. What made you decide to stay at home? Or what made your brother not decide to stay at home? <laughs> well, I'm a smart one, so that's obviously, obvious. Obviously. <laughs> but uh, at that time, um, Nebraska was still running the ball a lot. And so I wanted to go to the NFL, but I wanted to catch touchdown passes. And so I didn't want to go somewhere where I was just going to block for another great running back to go to the NFL. Uh, but also, Coach Finkel and Coach Hill did a fantastic job at recruiting me throughout the process. And they sat in my living room and they promised myself, my dad and my mom, that they would always get me the ball, and that they would always have a quarterback there to get me the ball. And so if you can sit in the living room and promise my mom that, then you're probably, uh, or at least you better, uh, stand up to your word. And so they lived up to it. And you know, another thing that I uh, always talk about is how Growing up in St. Joe, you're either an MU or a KU fan. There's, you know, some Nebraska fans, but it's MU KU. So I knew how big that rivalry was, but didn't really care about it. And uh, I thought how cool it would be to go to my home state university. And back in 97, when Mizzou almost beat Nebraska, I was at that kickball game. And I saw all these rabid, crazy Mizzou fans that you've never seen before because they hadn't been good. And so I thought, man, how cool would it be to go to my home state school and be a part of a turnaround and bring that kind of excitement back to the university and back to the athletic department. And uh, so, you know, on that dream and uh, on Gary Bingle and Andy Hill's word, I forged my own path to Mizzou and worked out pretty good. And that's a good follow-up question. A lot of times coaches probably go into athletes' households and make a lot of promises, but um, he kept his word to you, didn't he? He did. And, you know, that was one thing that uh, Coach Pinkle and that whole staff uh, they, they modeled and they instilled in all of us was integrity and honesty. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. And they played such an integral part in molding myself and a lot of others into young men. And those, that coaching staff, um, I would be honored to send my child to learn how to be a young man uh, under their tutelage any day. Promise made was a promise kept. Absolutely. <laughs> You played on a few good teams over your career at Mizzou, but your senior year in 2007 is widely considered one of, if not the best teams in Missouri history. Playing in the Big 12 championship game and winning the Cotton Bowl, tell us a little bit about that magical, magical year that Mizzou had. You know, that season was a culmination of a lot of squandered opportunities, to tell you the truth. We, uh, you know, in 2003, we, had, uh, we got to our first bowl game that we've been to since 98. Before 98, it had been even longer than that. Um, we had the 2004 season where we were supposed to be even better, and we didn't go to a bowl game. And in 05, we went back to the Independence Bowl game, and we were supposed to be better. We had these couple of seasons where we had good teams, but late in the season, we would fall apart in the fourth quarter of games. We would lose a strand of two or three games, and it would knock all our goals off the table. And so we had a locker room full of guys who had endured that and saw what it looked like when the team started to fall back down that same path. And we just made up in our minds that we weren't going to do that. We weren't going to be those guys, and we were going to be the team to get us over the hump. And while we didn't you know, win that big coach championship, we got as close as you could come to it. And uh, all of those things, pride, all the sweat, and the tears, things that everybody says, it was true. We had a bunch of guys who were two or three star recruits that were just grinding, wanting to win football games for the next guy, not just for themselves. And that's a testament to the coaching staff as well. They really, really instilled the right things in us. And we had such great leadership that uh, was able to funnel that down through the team and make sure that everyone was on board and it wasn't just something that we said. And all those things came together and uh, it was just a really, really special, special thing to be a part of and turn into a great season. Was that the year that Mizzou was ranked number one? It was. Mm -hmm. That was a magical year. Oh, so much fun. It was so much fun for us, but it was even more fun to see the excitement and the joy of the fans and to go to every game and there would be more and more people traveling with you on the road and just to see the excitement hear the stories of people's parents that went there back in the day when we were good and there's so much bad football 
for so long, and they were just so happy uh, to see us win and to be on top again. It was so cool and such a blessing to be a part of that. It was cool to be a Mizzou Tiger fan. Oh, so much fun. You know, kind of brought the spirit back. That team did. Really, starting with Brad Smith, they kind of brought the spirit back. What's it like to be inside of a, uh, the locker room with guys that are actually winning like that? Everybody likes to be around the winner. Was it was it magical behind the scenes too? It was, uh, but I mean, it was the same that it has always been. And it's so funny because all those guys in the locker room, they're just normal people. And so you see them do an interview on TV or in Sports Illustrated and things like that. And you know, people want their autographs and they talk about them in a certain way and think of them in a certain light. But, uh, they're just normal people, just like everybody else. Some of them aren't even that cool. They're actually really corny. It's it's uh, it's just it's really fun to see to know who they really are and to be able to joke around and things like that. Uh, just to get to see a side of them that other people don't know and they don't want to get to see. Well, Martin, you played under the winningest coach in Missouri history. How was it to play under Gary Pinkle? You kind of alluded to that already, but how was it to play under Coach Pinkle? It was so awesome. You know, he just instilled so many things inside you that were conducive to success on the football field, but beyond. And the longer I live and the more things that I get involved in outside of sports, you start to see all the things that they were trying to teach us, and all the things they were trying to get us to follow, and the habits that they were trying to instill and build in us, how they help you in the workplace. And the accountability level that they held us to, when I got into the real world, and was an employee at a business and saw people that were much older than me that didn't have the level of accountability uh, that I had, you know, not bragging on me, but you know, you can tell in just seeing excuses, you know, we were a no excuses program. It did not matter. You had to get it done. And so seeing how that wasn't the way that the world worked normally, and being a younger person and being around so many older people in the project management uh, realm. It just blew my mind, and I understood even more how valuable it was to be able to play college sports and to be underneath the tutelage of Coach Pinko and Mike Alton as well. I mean, we had such great leadership at the university at that time. We've got great leadership now, um, and Coach Pinko again, just himself, such a good guy, uh, huge heart for the community, and I'm actually on the board of his GP Made Foundation. Um, we talk regularly and. He's a, a great mentor and a great friend um, outside of being the old ball coach. So the bottom line, if he was a crap baker, made excuses, Coach Pinko wasn't your guy? Not at all. Didn't work for you. Because <laughs> we had a few of them that didn't last. So Martin, we are filming this show here in the Missouri Boot Hill. You know, there's a few guys that you played with in the video. Yeah. William Moore from a -Tide and Jimmy Jackson from Crothersville. I believe he's coaching at Crothersville now. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about playing with these Boot Hill guys <laughs> since you're here in their home area? Um, did you get to spend any time with them? I did. I uh, spent, you know, quite a bit of time with Willie Moe there for a period there when we were in college and uh, hung, out, hung out with Jimmy Jack a little bit. And they were great guys, you know, they were funny dudes. You know, that was one thing that everybody that I know from the boot, um, even the younger guys that I didn't play with, uh, they all had a really good sense of humor. And they all seemed to be into music as well. <laughs> but I uh, always enjoyed them and uh, it's always good to see them whenever we get back in the zoo or uh, do some of the things that we do outside of the zoo as well. So I think you retired in 2014, mm -hmm. had a few knee surgeries. Yep. Every time you thought you was getting ready to catch on with the next big team, going to the Super Bowl, you had an injury that derailed your life. So what brought you through all that? My faith in God. You know, that was the, the main thing is um, my faith was so strong that I knew that uh, whatever was happening, whatever was going on in life, it was part of God's plan. So what I had to do was focus on Him to get through whatever I was going through. Because no matter how hard that was, if I had just stopped right there and not kept him at the front, then I would have been on my own. And I was already a fish out of water because this wasn't my plan. So I was like, well, if this isn't my plan, whose is it? And if I'm not following the plan that he's got for me, where am I going? And so that was what really kept me. And the other thing that I probably haven't talked near about as much as I should is my parents. They were just such phenomenal people that, uh, you know, I mentioned that I felt like all I did was work really hard and I could, I could be whatever I wanted to be. Well, on the other side of that, I knew that if it didn't work out, if I wasn't, you know, if I ended up being a janitor, they were still going to love me. And there's nothing wrong with being a janitor at all. Be the best one you can be if that's where you are, if that's what your profession is. But my parents were going to love me 
whether or not I was uh, cleaning the floors or my own building. And so to me, that was so huge and it allowed me to pursue everything that, uh, that I wanted to without worrying about feeling silly if it didn't work out. I was in a solid structure and a solid base to go back to for support and then launch me to the next Did you build any long-term relationships with any former NFL players that you played with? So there's one guy uh, who's a really good friend down in, um, that I built a relationship with down in Dallas. His name is Jesse Holly. Um, he was a wide receiver. And he was actually on a show called uh, Mr. It was called yeah, Mr. Fourth and Long. And it was a uh, show that they aired, I think it was just down in Dallas or maybe it was on like TLC or something, but it was a competition. The guys that were undrafted and whoever won this competition got to go to training camp with the Cowboys. And so he actually was the guy who won the contest and we roomed together in training camp and uh, we worked out together in the off season and stuff. He was a good Christian guy as well. Does a lot of good things down there in the community in Dallas now. And uh, he's probably uh, the one relationship uh, that I still keep in contact with to this day from the NFL. We may have to revive that show. Yeah. Sounds like a good one. <laughs> Last question, Martin. In 2017, you were inducted to the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame. You're one of the greatest pass catching tight ends to ever play for the University of Missouri. You had an amazing career on the gridiron. If you had to sum it up and describe your journey, what would you say? How would you describe it? Fun. I mean, you, I got to play for five different teams in the NFL. And some people would think, like, oh my goodness, you know, you had to go from this team to that team, or they would say you never made it. But I was in my middle 20s, I was making a pretty good living, and I got to travel around the country playing football. I had to play with and meet and develop relationships with all these superstars, um, all the experiences. I mean, it was just a phenomenal period in my life. Um, and, and beyond that, you know, even just going back to my childhood and everything, I had a really good life. And then at the end of all of that, I met this awesome young lady, uh, my wife Gianni, and now we've got these two awesome kids. It's like my journey is it's fantastic. Uh, would like for it to be you know a little more uh, made a little bit more money playing football. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I mean, goodness, and I made a good living, so I don't have any complaints about it at all. It's just so fun, and to keep the right perspective, I think, is the most important part about it, but just so blessed to be able to do what I love for so long, and then marry someone that I love, and start a family, and teach them uh, ways to grow up in the love of Jesus Christ. It's, can't ask for anything better. You told me you could be back into playing shape in 12 weeks, so for all those teams out there needing to get that <laughs> in, he's your guy. Give me a call. <laughs> so just give us uh, a wrap up here. Thank you for coming to Malden. Absolutely. The Boot Hill loves you. There's many rabid Mizzou Tiger fans here. I mean, Mizzou Tigers are big here in Missouri Boot Hill. We don't get a lot of outreach from Mizzou, but rabid fans here. So let's wrap it up with a good word of advice or inspiration for the Mizzou Tiger fans out there. Absolutely. You know, whatever you're going through, keep going. Whatever your goals and whatever your dreams are, whatever those aspirations are, go after them. It doesn't matter if you fail. You just pick yourself up and you keep going towards something else. Uh, find yourself a good support structure. Uh, there are people out there that are just like you. And make sure you keep your faith rooted in God. And to go back to what you said about not getting a lot of love, I just got elected to the MU Alumni Association Board of Directors. So I'll see if we can scatter some of the love down here and get you some outreach. That'd be great. <laughs> Martin is 35 years old, I'm 51. He's like me, he's still trying to figure out what he's gonna do when he grows up. So there may be some bigger and better things and different careers, more careers ahead for you and your wife. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to them all. We wish you the best. Thank you for coming today. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you. Class. Thank you. Thanks, Lord. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's first episode of Season 2 of Very Interesting. I hope you have enjoyed it. Next Thursday night, please join us as we talk to Kenny Stroop, a real-life local character and author. Kenny will share his experiences with various celebrities and sports legends especially in and around Notre Dame athletics. We will be joined by former Arkansas State and Simo men's basketball coach, Dickie Nutt, to talk about his impressions of spending time with Kenny Stroop, whom he nicknamed the Magnet. Thanks again for joining us tonight. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with your friends and remember to look for us next Thursday evening. You won't want to miss it right here on A-Court Media. <laughs>